having to jackhammer those out and take them out and replace that. If we couldn't just even that step by elevating the base and then having it a grade, you know what I'm saying, on either side, and then we'll just put gravel in front. Mike, can you, you know, you're hearing what I'm saying? So, well, if you know that front step, I think it's the first step that is on. Over here, I meant the side step for the east side here, and Evelyn has a big problem with that. But uh, I think we might be rather than jackhammer that whole thing out and tear that all out and have to replace it, we might be able to just build a uh, a frame or a uh, what do you call it a mold yeah. to pour the concrete in, and then just graduate it down on either side to the north and south, and then we can just put rock up to it coming from the parking lot directly. But coming from either side, it'll just be a gradual rise. It's only going to be a, a few inches. I don't know exactly what it is. But we should be able to frame that in, just like if we were doing a sidewalk or something, and try that and see if that works before we go into a whole lot of expense. And even though she offered to help out with a, a little bit of it, I don't really want to take money from her. She's on a fixed income. and I mean, that kind of money. She's willing to give $100 and then add to that and everything. But I just. I'd rather we, I think it's something we can handle on our own without having to have her pay anything extra for it. There is something unique about this, though, and that's not to change my idea, but I was watching, I, I don't know if it was Zola Levitt or somebody, one of the uh, Messianic uh, Christian groups, and I found something I wasn't really aware of, and that is that the steps leading up to the temple, how many of you knew that they're not even? They're, they were intentionally made so that one may be this high, the next one's this high. So that when you approach the temple, you had to be conscious and focused on your approach. And so that people wouldn't just rush up the steps to the temple, or so that even as they came, it actually makes you kind of uncomfortable as you climb those steps because you have to think about the next step. Each time you take a step, you've got to be thinking, okay, is this one going to be 18 inches? It's not like the normal risers on a step. They were intentionally built to force people to concentrate on their approach to the temple. I thought that was really cool. So we have this, it's a divine step we've got out here. But that being said, we want to make it accessible to people too uh, so that they can you know, not feel like they're going to fall down and everything. But I did think it was kind of unique that the actual temple was built that way intentionally so that people would have to focus on their approach to, the, to uh, coming to meet with the Lord. So anyway, so that's our plan. We'll, we'll get together and sometime we'll figure out a way that we can do that. If we, how, if it shouldn't be that big a deal. And if, like I said, we can graduate, graduate it down on the sides and incline. It's not going to be that big of one. And then we'll just put rock in, in front of it coming from the parking lot. And hopefully that'll take care of the issue. Um, okay. So now, uh, any other prayer requests? Oh, yes. I, knew, I told Mike about it and then forgot. Uh, Diane, uh, uh, they, she had some blood pressure issues. And now, uh, yeah, Diane Byron, uh, Brian. And she's got, had a rough night last night. And uh, Ron called me earlier this afternoon. And I didn't, I, he left a voicemail because I wasn't able to take the call at the time. But uh, said that he wouldn't be here tonight because he didn't want to leave her alone. They think they kind of have an idea what they're going to do, how, they're, how to address the situation. But in the meantime, we're going to pray for that God just resolves that entire situation. Amen? Okay, so we've got Ellen, uh, or, uh, uh, yeah, Evelyn and, her two, Evelyn and her two grandsons and Diane. Anybody else? Yes, Alan. Kitty. Yes, yes, my uh, uh, the daughter-in-law's mother. Had a bad fall and she's recovering from some surgeries. Praise the Lord, we're happy to send them up. Praise the Lord for Robert. Hallelujah. Good man. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. Okay, so God knows all of these needs. He knew them before we mentioned them. Praise the Lord. 
but we mention him so that he gets the glory because he's going to move on all of these uh, situations and for each of these individuals. Praise the Lord. So let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that it's your desire, your will, your purpose to heal, to deliver, uh, to give breakthrough and deliverance, Lord. And we pray for the for the greatest needs of these individuals right now, Lord, for those that, that are most troublesome to them. And, Lord, you know every need that they have. And so we're just throwing this into your hands, Lord. We cast it onto you, Lord, to do what only you can do in the perfect fashion, Lord, for their healing, for their deliverance, for their breakthrough. Hallelujah. For your glory to roll into their lives and manifest in a mighty way. Roll like a river over them and into them and help them to experience, Lord, your great grace and, and glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Lord, we're just excited about the testimonies that will come from these individuals, Lord, for what you're doing in their life. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. All right. Uh, rather than take up an offering tonight, if you have one, you can just leave it on the table on your way out or whatever. Praise the Lord. We're not going to worry about it. Hallelujah. We'll just... You can uh, uh, just lay it on that little end table out there by the back door, and it'll be good. Praise the Lord. I'll remind you before you leave. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Praise the Lord. God's good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to be brief tonight because there's a brief crowd. And uh, hallelujah. God is able. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go, let's go to Psalms chapter 139, and uh, we'll read verses uh, 14, 14 through uh, 18. Psalms 139, verses 14 through 18. Praise the Lord. Amen. The psalmist says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee, when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Now that's kind of confusing, right? But it's, it's the same thought that we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. We existed in the mind of God millennia before we were actually born into this planet. Praise the Lord. So uh, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Praise the Lord. So God knows you, God loves you, and God is always with you. Praise the Lord. He's known you before your mama knew you. He knew you before grandma or grandpa or great, 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 go back as far as you want to Adam. God knew you before Adam. Praise the Lord. He knew all about you. He knew everything in you, every thought you've ever had. Every action you've ever taken, every motive, and yet he says, I love you. I love you, and I'll never leave you or forsake you. Praise the Lord. Now, you know that uh, every relationship demands, or every relationship requires at least, definition. You know what I'm saying? In other words, you have one kind of relationship with a friend, uh, another kind of relationship with a coworker, another relationship, a different kind of relationship maybe with a neighbor, a different relationship with your spouse, different relationship with your children, different relationship with your parents, your cousins, second cousins, kissing cousins. Praise the Lord. You've got a different relationship, in other words, with everybody. And they have to be defined, amen? Without definition, relationships get confused. Or they even get destroyed. 
because there are, without definition of the, the, uh, of the relationship, there's expectations in that relationship that aren't being met. Right? And because where there are unmet expectations in any relationship, there's going to be a lack of fulfillment in that relationship. Praise the Lord. Now, relationships are defined, and how they're defined determines how you interpret, how you interact, how you invest in, how you communicate with the other person. Amen? Now, here's the thing. My relationship with a neighbor, just all things being equal, are, can be completely different than your relationship with a neighbor, right? Because my definition of that relationship might be different than yours. You see what I'm saying? So unless that relationship is defined, like I've got one neighbor, good guy, we communicate when we see each other. He works and, you know, goes to work early in the morning, comes home early in the afternoon. I see him coming and going sometimes when I'm working out in the yard or whatever, but I don't see him all the time. The other one I just do not see. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Uh, the relationships are different just between the, they're both neighbors, right? But those relationships have been defined not so much by me necessarily, but by the other person, their attitudes, their, their way of doing things. So you understand what I'm saying? So here's what I'm saying. Like just if, if, everything, were cons if everything were equal, if all things were the same for everybody, I, I have a different relationship with Dan Dapper Dan, the guy that works at the dry cleaners, the guy that owns the dry cleaning company that gives us clothes and stuff all the time for the church and, and for Tom Salmon and others, okay? I've got a different relationship with him than I do with my brother, right? Now, I've got a different relationship with my children than I do with my brother, okay? I have a different relationship with my wife than I have with my children, I'm saying, because there's expectations, and those expectations are known, generally known, within relationships. So the relationships are all different, but because the relationships are defined, because one's my wife, one's my child, one's my brother, one's the dry cleaner, right? Then the expectations are different. Right? So... Because the expectations are different, I'm better able to understand my role and my response within that relationship. Have I got you completely confused? Good. That's my, that's my objective. Praise the Lord. Relationships are defined by the expectations within that relationship. Okay? Now... My definition might not exactly be the same as Sally's. That's what I'm saying. And when they differ, that's when you got a problem, right? Because there's an expectation there that I don't see as part of the definition of the relationship. Okay? But that's true in every relationship. That's why they have to be defined. All right, look at John chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. John 15, verse 15 and 16. Henceforth I call you not servants. This is Jesus. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you friends. He's defining a relationship. He's describing it and he's defining it, okay? So what the expectations are. Because the servant doesn't know what his Lord doeth, but I've called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit that your fruit should remain, that, who, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So Jesus is telling you how he sees his relationship, and he's defining it, what the expectations are, what your expectations can be in this relationship with Jesus, okay? Now, I said all that to say, how do you define your relationship with Jesus? 
Now, you, like I said a moment ago, you may say, okay, Nathan, I think you're overthinking this. You're overanalyzing. No, I mean, it's all, this is biblical. And it's natural at the same time. I mean, it isn't the fact that you have a relationship with Jesus, because some people would say, well, I mean, that's self-evident, and isn't that enough in itself that I have a relationship with Jesus? No, not if you don't know what the expectations of that relationship are. If you don't know what the definition of that relationship is, it can be a, a dysfunctional relationship, right. even though it's Jesus, right? Now, here's the deal. I've owned a lot of cars in my life. Some were clunkers, old, messed up, breaking down all the time. Others were nice, new. And when you go looking for a car, there's that new car smell. They even have uh, uh, aromatic sprays and, and little dangly things from your, <laughs> you know, from your club compartment or whatever. They're supposed to smell like a new car. They don't, but I mean, they're supposed to smell like that. Right. So then they have all these add-on features. You know, have you ever thought, well, I'm just going to go get this car. I, I just, I want something simple. They never show you that car first. They always show you the one with all of the extras, right? And that ruins you for the one you wanted to get because it was cheaper and didn't have all the extras. And now they've shown you all the leather seats and all the fancy doodads and what have you. And, and you go look at the one you were going to buy and you think, wow, that's kind of depressing. <laughs> so they show you all these extra future features, you know, the sunroof and the, uh, the, the leather interior and the, you know, the Bluetooth so that you can talk on the phone without using your hands, you know, and just talk to this dashboard, praise the Lord. <laughs> and every feature is something extra, right? And every extra feature is supposed to make or improve the driving experience, right? It enriched, the, the enriched interior, it's more comfortable, it's more luxurious, it's nicer riding, you know, and the heated seat or the cooled seats and all this kind of stuff. The environment of the interior of the vehicle is just so much better, you know, so much nicer. And it gets people to look at your car more than at somebody else's car. Right. Yours is fancier, yours is nicer, yours is whatever, you know. I mean, these are all add-on stuff. It's all the way they try to sell a car, right? It's added, it's, it, it, it's, it's to get people to envy your car. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay? All right, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Praise the Lord. Now with the vehicles, all of these add-ons come with a promise. It's going to make your car faster. It's going to make your, your car safer. It's going to make it more comfortable. It's going to make it more impressive. Each feature makes a specific and a unique promise. But they're all promising to make the vehicle better. Amen? Amen. That's how Jesus gets packaged in this 21st century church. Right. Add-on features. You get Jesus, and then if you want the premium package, you get what? Well, there's another add-on you could get that's health, healing. Or you could get the, the success package, Jesus and success. They're add-on features. There's just one problem with that. Jesus doesn't have any add-on features. Right. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. We've got people 
that have Jesus, but they don't have healing. They have Jesus, but they don't have deliverance. They have Jesus, but they don't have peace. They have Jesus, but they don't have breakthrough. Amen? When you got Jesus, you got all of that. They're not add-ons. They're not extras. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Praise Praise the Lord. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. I want to show you something real quick here. There's, There's four words here that are important. Grace, saved, faith, gift. Grace means favor, or one of the definitions is a divine effect on your heart. Saved literally is defined as delivered, protected, healed, preserved, to do well, to make whole. That word is sozo. So when you're saved, you are delivered. You're protected, you're healed, you're preserved, you're going to do well, and you're made whole. Nothing lacking. Amen? Faith literally simply means to trust, to yield, or believe. It's not a big thing. It's not a hard thing. We've made it a major deal and got everybody all confused about faith when faith is just simply believing what he said. It's just trusting that. It's not you. It's him. Amen. So, and gift, it's a present. It's a present. In fact, it's a present, but it's called a sacrifice offering. He gives us grace as a sacrifice offering. Jesus being the sacrifice offering. It's the gift. So by grace, amen, by divine favor, by a divine effect on your heart, you're saved through what? Faith. But grace, by divine effect on your heart or favor, you have been delivered, protected, healed, preserved, doing well, made whole. And it's done through You're trusting and yielding and believing in grace. Mm -hmm. In what God's done. That it was God that did it. And it's all a gift because of a sacrifice offering. So healing is not something else. Deliverance is not something else. Prosperity is not something else. It all comes in the package of Jesus Christ. They're not add-ons, regardless of what some denominations may think or what even some people may think. It's all a package. It all comes at the purchase of you through Jesus Christ. It's a package deal. You got it all. You don't have to have extra strength, extra faith, extra deep, heavy-duty faith. You just have to trust in him. The way you got saved, the way you got healed, because it's a package. It's a, it's a one-time thing. It isn't a bunch of add-ons as you go through your life. Come on. Believing in grace, trusting in grace, you receive the gift. Sozo. All right, Romans 10, verse 9. What does it say? This is how you get, this is the simplest definition of salvation, of how you get saved, okay? You believe that, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. Amen. So that's the picture of what we just read in Ephesians, right? Mm-hmm. Ephesians 2.8. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you're saved. All right, look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. 
As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. You live your life the same way you got saved. You believe I'm healed. You confess your healing. Amen. And you're healed. How many times, early on especially maybe, when you first got saved or when you first confessed Jesus as your Lord, did the enemy come and tell you, you're not saved? He might even sneak in every once in a while now and tell you you're not saved because you don't act like it. <laughs> right? Yep. I mean, anybody ever not act like a perfect Christian? And when, you, when that happens, the enemy immediately comes in and says, well, if you were saved, you wouldn't be acting like You wouldn't say that. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't behave that way. You wouldn't think that way. Even if you don't do it, you think it. Amen? Yep. He does the very same thing with healing. He said you're healed, the same as he said you're saved. Right? He said you're healed, but you don't feel healed. Right? The pain's there. The issue's there. How do you how do you do how do you then get healed? You're already healed. You have to believe it. You have to confess it with your mouth. You believe it in your heart, and you're healed. Mm -hmm. How long does it take for the manifestation? I don't know, but I just know that that's the that's the way it's done. There isn't a plan B. There isn't another add-on. There isn't a let's run back to the manufacturer and have him give us the extra cold air. Right? Or let's have him replace the seats and let's get the leather seats now that we have the vehicle. Now you got the whole thing. You got it all when you got Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen? Healing, prosperity, deliverance, it all works the same way. As you've received, walk the same way in him. Look, it's like a, it's like a wedding shower. How many of you know we're the bride of Christ? This is like the wedding shower. Not only are we betrothed and married to him, and there's going to be a great celebration, he gives us a wedding shower. All the gifts come with it. Healing, deliverance, all the prophetic gifts, they're all there. They're all part of the package that comes in our relationship with Jesus. So Jesus is not an add-on feature. So what's the right imagery that uh, communicates the nature of the relationship that we have with Jesus. A love affair. Praise the Lord. A love affair. Yep. Intimacy with Jesus. It might seem a little extreme or odd, but it's biblical. Look at Hosea chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5. Our relationship is like a love affair. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord, toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and a half omer of uh, 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 barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So he's using a metaphor between a man marrying a, a prostitute and God marrying us. He makes a commitment, and we go chasing after other guys or other gals. Mm -hmm. So he uses a love affair as a definition of his relationship. He's committed, we're not. Praise the Lord. He uses adultery in the Old Testament to show how we treat the relationships that we have with him. Now, the, in the New Testament of the New Covenant, could, he could have used any reference to the church he wanted. Could have, he could have said, they're, they're acquaintances of mine. They're friends of mine. They're admirers of, of mine. They're religious associates of mine. 
but instead look at Revelation 21, verses 9 through 11. Revelation 21, 9 through 11. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Isaiah 54, verse 1. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Bring forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Verse 11 and 12. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make thy windows of agate, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. The same description of the Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Mm -hmm. That's us. Amen? Amen? He chose a bride, not by accident, but by design. And there is intimacy implied by the very label of us being the bride. And I think that goes without having to be explained, right? Look at John chapter 15, verses 3 through 9. Intimacy is implied by this relationship. John 15, verses uh, 3 through 9. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Now if we were to Take this literally and use the metaphor that we're talking about here. You are a virgin through the word which I have spoken unto you. Amen. You abide in me, I abide in you. We become one. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, amen, a woman can't have a child without the male, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. First, the supernatural. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and it'll be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. Bear fruit. Birth miracles. Birth what only can come from God. Amen? You are the one that he chose. He chose you. He spotted you and said, that's the one. That's the one for me. You ever heard about love at first sight? Or people see somebody and they say, I'm going to, that's going to be my wife. Well, that's how God sees you. That's how he saw you. You're the one. You're the one he desires to know in the most intimate way. You're the one he wants to birth God things through. Praise the Lord. He's not content to stand at a distance and, and wave. He wants to draw near. He wants to be intimate. He's not looking for a date. Nope. Amen. He's looking for an eternal honeymoon. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. John chapter 5 and verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. 
chapter 17, verses 21 through 23. they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Now, I know you think, what the heck has that got to do with anything? Well, have you ever noticed people that have been married a long time. They start to have similar idiosyncrasies. In other words, they pick up each other's crazy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Their habits start to become more alike. They even start finishing each other's sentences. Amen. You know what he's going to say, and you say it to save him the time to say it. Amen. Jesus said, I only say what my father says. I can finish his sentences because I know what he's going to say, and I only say what he says. I and my father are one. I have the same idiosyncrasies he has. I have the same habits he has. He's talking about our relationship, amen? He's talking about relationship, amen? They even start using the same expressions, although I don't say holy buckets yet. <laughs> Happens to be one of Sally's favorites. Um, you do tend to pick up on one another's language and you kind of talk the same way amen and what's even scarier for Sally is that you start to even look alike praise the Lord over that long time relationship praise the Lord yeah how else are we going to do it praise the Lord the truth is they've grown intimate almost literally two have become one that's what Jesus is talking about, this relationship that we have. John chapter 14, uh, 9 through 20. John 14, verses 9 through 20. Just another scripture or so, and we're done. Okay, so Jesus says unto him, I, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. How many of you know when you get married, you take that other person's name, you have legal right? Absolutely. You have a legal right there. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more yet. But yet ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Amen. That's the picture of the relationship that Jesus invites us to share with him. Oneness, yeah. intimacy, yeah. a life in the most literal fashion defined by intimacy. Last scripture and we'll close. Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 5. Single barren. Thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wives, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of your habitation. Spare not. Lengthen the cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you are going to break forth on the right hand and on the left. And your seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. 
Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be confounded, for you shall not be put to shame. For you shall forget the shame of your youth, shall not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Praise the Lord. He chose you. Praise the Lord. And he chose you for intimacy. He chose you to carry his name. And all of the authority that goes with that is yours as his spouse, as his wife. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand tonight. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for bearing with my random reality here. Praise the Lord. It's the truth. That's the way God wants you to see this relationship with him. And if you see it that way, all that he has is yours. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. In Jesus' name. If you have an offering.